Okay. Welcome back. This short lecture is going to cover the material from Chapter 7, and it'll be the second part of the chapter. We discussed methods of passive transport in class, and so in this part of the lecture, we're just going to discuss um, active transport methods that cells can use. You can, of course, use this in conjunction with the Chapter 7, Part 2 printable slides that are available on Blackboard. And you can also use it in conjunction with the Chapter 7 lecture review sheet. All right, so let's get into this. First, we need to discuss what active transport is, and then I'm going to give you several different methods of active transport that cells use. So first, let's discuss what active transport is. Now, you may remember that passive transport was a means for cells to move molecules again, or with the gradient. So they would move them from areas of high concentration to areas of low concentration. And passive transport included things like osmosis and diffusion, which you played with in lab. Active transport, on the other hand, moves molecules where they don't want to go. Active transport methods move molecules against the gradient. So typically this is from areas of low concentration to high concentration. For instance, in this diagram on the right, you can see these little diamond molecules, whatever they are, they are being pushed into the cell. And they're already starting to get crowded on this intracellular side. So they don't really want to be there. They would prefer to spread themselves out. But this little protein here is forcing them across the membrane and forming a high concentration area. So this represents active transport. Now, because the cell is moving those molecules where they don't want to go, there's going to be some extra energy required. So you'll notice that ATP is being used by this little protein to move things from one side to the other. And that's another hallmark of active transport. All right, at this point, I would like you to pause the video for just a minute, and I want you to think about this question. I have two simple diagrams here, and I want you to tell me which one represents passive transport and which one uh, represents active transport. And I want you to provide me with two reasons um, why it's passive or why it's active. All right, so pause the video for a moment, and I'll talk to you again in a second. Okay, hopefully you were able to figure out which one was which, and now we can discuss the reasons why. Okay, this diagram, diagram A, represents passive transport. What you see here is a piece of cell membrane. You see a protein, a carrier or a channel, and you see some molecules being transported. Now, why might you think this is passive transport? Where the, there are two basic reasons. One reason is that the molecules are moving from an area of high concentration to an area of lower concentration. So these molecules are moving with the gradient, and that represents passive transport. The other reason you might identify this as passive transport is that there's no ATP molecules being used, being broken down to power this process. So remember that there is kinetic energy in the molecules moving through the channel or moving through the membrane even, but there's no additional energy being used by the cell in the form of ATP. So that's definitely passive transport. The other diagram, diagram B, represents active transport. Now again, how can you tell? Well. In this diagram, we've got a channel or um, a carrier, and we have a membrane, and we have some molecules that are moving. But notice that these molecules are now moving from an area of low concentration to an area of high concentration. They're being crowded together. So they are moving against the gradient. Also, we see that ATP is being used to make this happen. So that's the second hallmark of active transport. Now, one thing that often confuses students 
is the fact that there is a carrier or a channel protein involved in both of these examples. So you see it here in the active transport, which is very common. But I also included a protein in the passive transport. And that can also happen. Just because you see a protein being used, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's active transport. The difference between these two, oops, excuse me, the difference between these two types of transport really has to do with where the molecules are moving and whether or not ATP is being used. But both active and passive transport can use proteins to help them with this process. If it were a type of passive transport, remember, we would call this facilitated diffusion. That's the specific type that's happening here. OK, so now that we've defined active transport, I want to give you three good examples of types of active transport, moving things from areas of low concentration to high concentration. First type of active transport we'll talk about are these things called pumps. Now, pumps are specialized proteins, and as the name implies, they pump molecules against the gradient. A really great example of a membrane pump is the sodium potassium pump. Now, this is a type of pump that is found on your nerve cells and also on your muscle cells. And it's one of several pumps that are going to help those cells when they generate electricity. Now, if you take an anatomy and physiology class, you'll learn about the sodium potassium pump in great detail. You'll learn all about how that works and about things called action potentials and how electricity is generated. For our purposes, though, I want to keep it fairly simple. I just want to show you how this pump works and how it represents active transport. All right. So I'm actually going to show you a little animation of this. Let me flip over to the animation. Here we go. All right. So what we have here in this animation is a phospholipid bilayer. That should look familiar to you. And this really cool membrane pump, this big purple protein here. Now in cells that generate electricity, what they like to do is they like to take sodium ions and push them outside of the cell. And at the same time, they like to take potassium ions and push them inside the cell. So they use these concentration gradients to generate electricity. And so what we're trying to do is move the sodium out and the potassium in. And that's what this little pump will do. Let me start the animation. And I'll talk along with it. All right. So again, that purple protein is the pump itself. You can see that it has three binding sites for sodium. And once it's full, it will change shape with the energy in ATP, changes conformation, we say. And that allows the sodium to go outside of the cell. And you can see that nice gradient building up out there. Now it has room, it has binding sites for potassium some potassium ions will bind. It will change shape again. And eventually it will release the potassium inside the cell. Now these areas of sodium and potassium represent areas of stored energy. And so again, that cell is going to eventually use these gradients that have been building up to make some work happen. In this case, it's going to generate electricity. But this pump just changes shape back and forth, back and forth, and pumps sodium out, and it pumps potassium in. This is probably the most common um, membrane pump in your body. Let's return to the lecture. So that's membrane pumps, a form of active transport. Another form of active transport that I want to talk to you about is something called co-transport. Now that word co should tell you a little something about what's going on here. Co as in community or co as in cooperation. 
In co-transport, what we're going to have are two proteins that work together to transport something into or out of the cell. So this diagram up here shows a great example of co-transport. This is a, a method that's used often in uh, plant cells. And what the plant cell is trying to do is move this molecule, sucrose, into the cell. It wants to move it in so it can break it down for energy. Now sucrose is kind of big and kind of bulky, so it's going to need a lot of help to be brought inside the cell, and this is going to require a lot of energy. So it's going to require two of these proteins working together. Now one of these proteins will act in a passive way, and the other will act in an active way. So let's see how this whole crazy system works. Okay. First, we have this proton, uh, protein, excuse me, and this protein is referred to as a proton pump. So the name tells you what it does. This little protein is responsible for grabbing protons, H plus ions, hydrogen ions, and it pumps them outside of the cell. So you can see that these protons are building up outside the cell. Now that little pump is working actively, and the reason is that it's moving these protons against their gradient, where they don't want to go. It also uses ATP to do this, so it's pushing those protons across. So that's active. Now why is it doing that? What's the point of that? What does that have to do with sucrose? Well, I want you to think of this whole system as working kind of like a water wheel. Okay. In a water wheel, water is going to pour down onto part of the wheel, and the force of that water is going to push the wheel around. And that wheel can do some work. That could be um, attached to something for grinding grain, for instance, or it could be attached to a turbine for generate ele generating electricity. But the more water you have at the top here, the more work your wheel can do. So in this analogy, the proton pump is acting like the river. It's acting like the water here. And it's building up a good store of water at the top of this wheel. The hydrogen ions that are building up represent a pool or a store of energy that's going to be used to do some work. Okay. Now, the second protein over here, that represents the wheel itself. This is the part that's actually going to do the work that we want to do. It has two parts to it. It has a portion that will allow hydrogen ions to flow through it, and it also has a portion that will grab onto sucrose and bring it inside. Once this little protein opens its gates, these hydrogen ions are going to flow back through it. Now they're going to do that because they're crowded and they want to get back inside the cell. So they are now going to move passively from an area of high concentration to low concentration inside the cell. And as they flow through this protein, they're going to energize it. That protein now has the energy to grab onto sucrose and push it inside. So the second protein represents the passive part of the process. The proton pump represents the active part of the process, and they both have to work together in order to move the sucrose inside. So it's co-transport, also known as coupled transport. Okay, the third type of active transport that I want to talk to you about is called bulk transport. Now from that name, you should be able to tell that we're going to be moving something big either into or out of the cell. Kind of like buying in bulk if you go to um, Sam's Club or um, a store like that. Um, instead of buying one roll of toilet paper, you end up buying a block of like 30 rolls of toilet paper because it's cheaper. That's buying in bulk. So bulk means a lot of something. Right. How is this going to work? Well, in bulk transport, this, the plasma membrane itself is used to bring something in or push something out. 
In this case, we have an amoeba, and it's going to wrap itself around a particle. So it wraps its membrane around a particle that it wants to bring inside. And because that membrane is a liquid, it can seal itself off. And then it has that particle trapped inside a little vesicle. And this vesicle can travel further inside the cell and be broken down or used for whatever. So we're wrapping the membrane around things to bring them in or push them out. Okay. Now there are a few vocabulary words that go along with bulk transport. So let's go over those briefly. If something is bring, being, being brought excuse me, into the cell, we call that endocytosis. So here you can see the membrane folding inward. It pinches off and it brings this vesicle into the cell. Exocytosis is the reverse. This is pushing something out of the cell. So there's already something inside the cell. It's trapped inside a little vesicle, which is made of membrane around the outside. And that vesicle is going to fuse with the membrane on the outside of the cell. And since it's a liquid, it can do that. And then this little vesicle will fold itself inside out and it will push whatever that is outside of the cell. This method is used a lot by cells that need to release a lot of a chemical all at once. For instance, pancreatic cells, cells inside your pancreas, need to manufacture and release a lot of insulin all at once. It sends that insulin signal into your blood. And so that's the way that it does it. It'll put it in a vesicle. The vesicle fuses with the membrane and the insulin gets released. That's exocytosis. Yeah. Another term, phagocytosis. Sometimes called phagocytosis. You can say it either way. Phagocytosis is also known as cell eating. So this is when a cell brings a large particle, typically a food particle, or sometimes a bacterium, something like that, inside the cell. So it's eating a big chunk of food is the idea here. Um, or sometimes bacteria will use this to sneak inside a host cell and infect it. That's kind of tricky too. Okay. So phagocytosis is a type of endocytosis because we're moving into the cell. And I want to show you a neat little example of this happening. Okay. Here we can see in this diagram phagocytosis in action. Um, you can see this food particle. It's being wrapped up in a piece of membrane and brought into the cell. And I'm not sure what this food particle is. Um, one of my favorite guesses from a previous class is that it's a chicken nugget, which is plausible, I think. Let me show you this little video, make sure it's muted. This is an amoeba, and this amoeba is going to phagocytize a particle. Now it's moving really fast. This has been sped up quite a bit because amoeba normally aren't this quick. But look at how it wraps its membrane around this particle and it's reaching around. Eventually it's going to engulf it and bring it inside the cell. It was kind of quick, let's watch that again. Here it comes. It's going to wrap its pseudopods around that object and pull it inside, make a giant vesicle or a food vacuole maybe in that case. Okay. So that's a very dramatic example of phagocytosis. Another type of endocytosis that you'll hear about is something called pinocytosis or pinocytosis. Pinocytosis is known as cell drinking. So this is when the cell brings a liquid, a drop of liquid inside. And so what it will do is it will kind of bend its membrane inward and the little liquid flows into that little vesicle and then it pinches off and comes on inside. Okay, 
third type of endocytosis that you need to know about is known as receptor-mediated endocytosis. Receptor-mediated endocytosis is used when the cell wants to bring a very specific type of molecule inside. So it wants to capture specific things. Right? The way that this works is that before the process starts, receptor proteins are going to be built into the outside of the membrane. So you can see those here as these little Y-shaped proteins. And they're hanging out on the outside of this membrane. Now the, the molecule of interest will come along and it will bind with these receptors. And when enough of them are bound, that stimulates this membrane to bend inward and pinch off into a vesicle. And now the molecule of choice is inside. It can be digested or it can be transported other places. And then this piece of membrane can go back and rejoin the outside membrane so it can capture some more of those molecules. Okay. For example, receptor-mediated endocytosis is used by the liver and it's used to capture um, LDL cholesterol and help bring it inside. All right, so that's active transport. I hope you found this video helpful. Um, I also included in this video some other videos that you might find helpful. This one's really good. Um, it's a good review of both passive and active transport techniques. It has some really nice little animations with it. So feel free to watch that one if you like. This one is from McGraw-Hill, and it's a nice little animation talking about bulk transport as well. And of course, you're always welcome to check out the useful links um, folder on Blackboard. I always put extra stuff there um, as I find it. All right. Thank you for joining me, and I will see you in class for Chapter 8, talking about enzymes and energy.